good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So glad to see everybody here. We didn't wash away. <laughs> Beautiful day. Uh, I'd like to um, start with the announcements. Uh, the calendar is also at Penn Valley Parish .info, and the district conference gathering is. You're invited to join in worship, celebration, and holy conferencing as we organize our State College District of Susquehanna Conference starting at 3 p.m. September 22nd at Mount Nittany United Methodist Church. It's at 1500 Branch Road in State College. We'll worship together, celebrate the ministry of our district, establish a new name for the district, affirm our district committees, and put hands to the plow as we move out in mission and ministry within our communities. Registration information is forthcoming. All church, all clergy and laity, especially lay representatives, are strongly encouraged to attend. August 15th, this Ladies Coffee and Conversation begins at 9.30 a.m. at St. James UMC in Colburn. Ladies from the Valley are invited to chat and have a wonderful time. You do not have to belong to this or any church. August 16th to the 24th, of course, is Center uh, County Grange Encampment and Fair, and the attention to campers, if you want to hear the message from your tent or camper, you can call the sermon by phone, and the number is there. It's 422-6238. The Grange Fair Sunday, the Penns Valley Men's Choir performs its service at 9 a.m. at the Pomona Grange Church service at 7 p.m., both in the south stage, south side stage. September 3rd is the Spruce Town Church Ad Council and Trustees Meeting. And September 4th, St. James trustees meet at 6.30 p.m. and the ad board meeting at 7 p.m. Are there any other uh, announcements? Okay, then our centering words. Bring your whole heart before God. All your grief, anger, frustration, joy, hope, and praise. God loves and welcomes you just as you are. We have the service of the acolyte.
God is here, welcoming us just as we are, and in thanksgiving for all God has blessed us with, and in gratitude for all the ways that God loves us, may our offerings be pleasing in his sight. Let us prepare to bless the gifts by first singing together the doxology. In this sacred moment of giving, we come before you recognizing your unwavering compassion and tender mercy. As we offer our gifts, we also lift our hearts in prayer for all who are burdened with pain and uncertainty. May your healing touch reach those in need, and may your love bring comfort and strength to troubled hearts. We entrust our prayers to you knowing that you hear and respond with boundless grace. For this we will give you the glory. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to have a little change in our order because at this time we're going to have a wonderful new member and anyone who would like to stand with her come forward. So if you would come up here today. Thank you. This is Jen Lawrence, and she's joining our church today, which is very exciting. So I do have some liturgy for you. I will show it on the screen, so uh, you will be fine. Uh, I did this very carefully, so I'm sure it's going to go very, very well. Um, but we're going to begin with the reaffirmation of faith and the profession of faith and the reception into the local church. And I begin with you, congregation. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We're incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without price. Through confirmation and through the reaffirmation of faith, through the profession of faith, we renew the covenant declared at our baptism, acknowledge what God is doing for us, and affirm our commitment to Christ's holy church. I present to you Jennifer Lawrence, who comes seeking profession, uh, professing membership, originally with Stockland United Methodist Church. However, that church closed and memberships were not moved. Therefore, she's joining as if joining for the first time. We begin with renunciation of sin and profession of faith. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, I gotta make sure I'm doing this correctly. Do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? That's the right answer. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord, in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races. According to the grace given to you, will you remain faithful member of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representative in the world? I will. Do you, church, as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? We do. <laughs> Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include this person now before you in your care? Would God stop so that we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ? We will surround this person with the community of God and the community of Christ. Let's make a row and trust us with God and be found faithful in his service to others. We will pray for her that she may be a true disciple who walks in the way that leads to life. Thank you. Let us join together in professing the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. 
Do you believe in God the Father? I believe, I believe in God, God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God, who is the Son of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He ascended to heaven. On the third day, he rose again, and he ascended to heaven, and he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the community of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I want to bless this water. This water represents our baptism. There are some who dunk and there are some who sprinkle. It is not the means by which you receive the water so much as the intention within you when you do. That all things die away. The old sin nature is removed and cleansed away. And when you are returned with this wonderful water coming off, you have been cleansed and born anew. With that, we go to the Thanksgiving over the water. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. Eternal Father, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. After the flood, you set the clouds in the clouds a rainbow. And when you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. Their children, you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. Sing to the Lord, all the earth, tell of God's mercy each day. Pour out your Holy Spirit. Oh, I'm sorry. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. He declared his works to the nations. His, his glory among all the people. Pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water and those who receive it to wash away their sin and clothe them in righteousness throughout their lives, that dying and being raised with Christ, they may share in his final victory. All praise to you, eternal Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever. Amen. Remember your baptism <laughs> and be grateful. The living water is poured out for all of us. Amen. Jennifer, the Holy Spirit will work within you, that having been born through the water and the Spirit, you may live as a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. Remember your baptism and be thankful, church. As members of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers? 
your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness. Well. Members of the household of God, I commend these, this person to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase her faith, confirm her hope, and perfect her in love. We give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we we'll offer you in your Christian love, as members together with you in the body of Christ and in his congregation of the United Methodist Church. We do know our God faithfully to participate in the ministry of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness, and that everything we are able to provide to Jesus Christ. Amen. The God of all grace, who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish you and strengthen you, that you may live in grace and peace. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. And we'll now pass the peace of Christ so that you have an opportunity to greet Jen in any way that you wish. And we also have a gift which I'll carry back for you. <laughs> There are many things that we hold in confidence, things that we're not really able to share out loud. Uh, they're both joys and concerns, but we do go to God in silent prayer first with those, and then we all pray together. Heavenly Father, faith is a very tricky thing. Faith is that ability to let go of something, like the analogy of the child who's trying to escape a burning building, gripping for dear life to the windowsill as a stranger's voice says, drop, I've got you, I'll catch you. It is faith that allows that child to let go. Do we really believe in Jesus? Do we dare to believe in Jesus? It's a question that often goes unspoken, but does rest in our hearts, Lord. Help us in our unbelief. The world certainly encourages unbelief. <coughs> Help us to be courageous enough to accept the love that you have for us and the power that you have to forgive and heal our souls that is evident everywhere we look outside when we feel the breeze on our face and the sunshine, when we hear the birds, hear the water, see the flowers. We live in a time of great hostility, fear, and strife. And it's easy for us to succumb to the terrors of the world, forgetting that you are with us at all times, seeking peace and hope through people willing to be peace and hope to another. You've asked us to be instruments of peace and justice, to pray for people rather than pray upon them. But to do this, we need transformation, to change our attitudes and our practices to reflect your love and compassion, not the world. And we have to agree not to be vehicles for greed or to seek out frivolous approval from those we wouldn't even seek an opinion. Jesus is the bread of life, and he's taught us the importance of serving others, and in that service, we do honor to you. So we ask you to create in us hearts that are eager to serve and to witness to your love. Open our lives today and pour your healing mercies into them, that we may be messengers of hope to all whom we meet, regardless of our circumstances. We are called to be people of prayer. So let us share the words that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and forever. Amen. I'm going to go
go ahead and skip our hymn, and we're going to go right into the scripture since the time is about 11.30. Is it okay? You can sing it in the car on the way home if you want. You can sing it anywhere. anywhere. Um, but we're going to begin with our scripture for the day. We have one main scripture that we're going to focus on, because life is very complicated. Now, we already know that. But the lives of the people we read about in the Bible were also very complicated. When David was too young to serve in the army, but old enough to journey to take a care package to his brothers who were, he was learning life skills intended to be used, practiced, and honed for a lifetime. The smaller battles David fought in his formative years are the same battles we fight for a lifetime. We never outgrow the battle. His life of service, his personal life, how he came to marry, the situation and circumstances of his children were very complicated. Because there was a time when David lost the war with arrogant pride, acting a lot more like a Goliath than a David. In this first passage, he finds himself at literal war with his own son, Absalom, who led an uprising against him. But I want you to listen carefully and, and ask yourself, do, does he see his son as his enemy? Or does he see in his son the consequences of his losing smaller battles in the near past? We're going to hear 2 Samuel 18, verses 5 through 9 and 15, 31 to 33. The king charged Joab, Abishai, and Ittai saying, deal gently for my sake with the young man Absalom. And all the people heard when the king charged all the commanders concerning Absalom. Then people went out into the field against Israel, and the battle took place in the forest of Ephraim. The people of Israel were defeated there before the servants of David, and the slaughter there that day was great, 20,000 men. For the battle there was spread over the whole countryside, and the forest devoured more people that day than the sword devoured. Now Absalom happened to meet the servants of David, for Absalom was riding on his mule, and the mule went under the thick branches of the great oak, and his head caught fast in the oak, so he was left hanging between heaven and earth, while the mule that was under him kept going. And ten young men who carried Joab's armor gathered around and struck Absalom and killed him. Behold, the Cushite arrived, and the Cushite said, Let my lord the king receive good news, for the Lord has freed you this day from the hand of all those who rose up against you. Then the king said to the Cushite, Is it well with the young man Absalom? And the Cushite answered, let the enemies of my lord the king and all who rise up against you for evil be as that young man. The king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And thus he said as he walked, Oh, oh my son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, would I had died instead of you, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. This is the word of God for the people of God. Right. Thanks be to God. <laughs> Godly leadership focuses on kingdom priorities <coughs> rather than a personal agenda. Bold pursuit of kingly kingdom pursuits at the expense of any personal agenda was what we saw young David was all about. He was able to, through his incredible faith in God, to do what he could not do for him, so that he could do what he could do. That's who slew Goliath. That's who took down the, the giant. But this David isn't that David. This David is clearly a lot older, but he is not wiser. This David stayed home. This David sent troops to do what he wasn't willing to do with the expectation the guy that uh, they would bring back the guy leading the uprising to his father. 
What's going on with David? A lot's going on with David. For some time, a lot has been going on with David. His faith has been undermined and eroded by poor choices he's made one after another after another. Choices he did not go to God about. It led to him having multiple wives and concubines, making rash decisions without going to God first. Of course, we know about the sexual sin with Bathsheba, made worse by his attempt to cover up the child by murdering her husband Uriah. And we see here allowing Joab to influence him to the point of handing him power he couldn't handle well. He had no discipline. And the ones following the one with no discipline had no discipline. Then again, David wasn't raising his family with proper discipline. He's no longer revered for who he used to be, what he once was, because what he has become speaks louder. He's lost the support of the people of Israel because they lost confidence in him. Where his confidence used to be in God, now David believed he didn't need God. The bottom line is, he's been removed from the capital of Jerusalem and skipping communal worship at the temple for some time. Why? didn't think he needed it. Pride. Pride is a subtle yet powerful force that leads us away from God's purpose. And it's contagious. When you get around someone who's very prideful, they can delight in zinging people. Sometimes we catch it. We want to zing people too. We look at three passages, the three main points today, and it doesn't take long. But we're going to start with David and Goliath from 1 Samuel, and then we'll listen to two New Testament passages. We're going to begin with 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 45 to 47. David, who is younger and smaller than everyone in the army, and certainly a lot smaller than Goliath, approaches him. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. This day the Lord will deliver you up into my hands, and I will strike you down and remove your head from you, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. A humble heart wins the day. I've never seen two grouches, two curmudgeons go at each other and either one win. Have you? You talk about an ongoing battle that never ends, kind of like the song that Lamb Chop sang. This is the song that never ends. It just goes on and on, my friends. David talked about what God did because David looked back at everything God had already done as the blessed assurance of what God could make possible that day. But David was young, a shepherd. He was teachable as well. You don't outgrow being teachable. You make a choice not to be any longer. And because he was teachable, he faced Goliath, who was full of pride and confidence in his size, in his weapons, in his strength, in his reputation. He represents human arrogance. And David, on the other hand, embodies humility. He takes only what he needs, smooth stones. Why? You knock him out, you got a very nice sword right there. It's the one that Goliath was showing off not long before. He's teachable and willing to learn. He acknowledges that the battle belongs to the Lord, not to him. David's victory wasn't just over Goliath, but over the pride that often makes us rely on our strength and wisdom rather than God's. In the message, Bible paraphrases the verse that I just showed you this way. 
David answered, you come at me with sword and spear and battle axe. I come at you in the name of God of the angel armies, the God of Israel's troops, whom you curse and mock. To this, or this very day, God is handing you over to me. God is handing you over to me. The whole earth will know that there is an extraordinary God in Israel. David didn't say, this day, everybody's going to know how cool David is, how brave David is, how mighty David is. It was how extraordinary God is. That's the humility we need to adopt in our own battles with our own pride. And we can't fight someone else's pride. Only our own. The second passage comes from Matthew chapter 23, verses 11 and 12. This is Jesus teaching about what does make you the greatest. But the greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. Now these words turn people's values of the day upside down. Because we live in a culture that often glorifies self-promotion and pride. Because I'm worth it. Right? <laughs> but Jesus teaches that true greatness comes from humility and serving others. Pride seeks to elevate ourselves, but humility recognizes our dependence on God. The God who knows what we do not know, who hears the conversations we are not privy to, who understands the yearnings in the hearts of people we do not know, the ones that many pray upon instead of pray for, and yet makes it possible for us to serve him well anyway. The message paraphrase words this this way. Do you want to stand out? Then step down, be a servant. If you puff yourself up, you'll get the wind knocked out of you. But if you're content to simply be yourself, your life will count for plenty. Jesus is talking about the greatest among you must be a servant because that is what leads to a life with impact. Jesus warns that pride can lead to a great fall, as it so often does. Someone gets a little too puffed up in their belief and find out everything they thought was true was wrong. Anybody ever been there and done that? I have. I have in the past voted for someone for president, believing they were the best person for the job, only to be lied to and realize, how could I have been such a fool? I couldn't double down on it. I can't argue with truth and reality. But when we know better, we do better, right? Certainly David found out that he didn't offer his very best influence over his son Absalom. And I think David also realized as a result, Absalom suffered far more than David did. Not only in how he died, but in how he lived his very short life. Humility learned lived and taught by example leads to a life with impact. And finally, we turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. You want to talk about somebody who struggled with pride. Oh my word. I think Peter was probably pretty annoying in the first four Gospels. We know that he irritated Jesus to the point of him calling him Satan at one point, but Nonetheless, he was someone that was very prideful. He, he really took pride in his great ideas. And if you remember last week, one of his great ideas caused God himself to speak to Peter, James, and John to say, hey, this is my son Jesus. Listen to him. In other words, maybe not listen to yourself all the time. Maybe, maybe chat with Jesus about what your plan is. See if it aligns with him. He definitely struggled with it. But it's a different Peter we see in 1 Peter really starting from the book of Acts on. So this is 1 Peter 5, verses 5 and 6. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time. 
Peter echoes the wisdom of Proverbs, reminding us that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. You know, grace and mercy is something that is given. It is not earned. It is not deserved. But we live in a time, much like they did, where grace and mercy, I'm not giving you any grace. I'm not giving you any mercy unless you deserve it. They don't understand what the words mean. No one earns grace and mercy. When someone says, have mercy on me, a sinner, they understand they've committed the crime. And so God gives us this wonderful grace and mercy for someone who says, you know, I wish I would have known what I know now, what before I did or said that thing, but I do know now and I know better now, so I'm gonna do better now and I'm really sorry that I was wrong, that my assumption was incorrect, that I flew off the handle anyway. Forgive me, Lord. That's humility. I don't know what the future holds. I don't know how things are gonna turn out. Nobody does. Doesn't stop people from saying that they do. Pride. Because I can tell you right now, I have been surprised pretty surprised a handful of times in my life. Didn't see that coming. And found out no one did. So this passage challenges us to intentionally clothe ourselves in humility. I think it's more like a snowsuit. A snowsuit is intended to keep the snow out, yes, but it's also to keep the heat in. Remember how I said pride can be contagious, like yawning? It's not just to keep pride from getting in, it's to keep yours from getting out. Hence, it's clothed in humility. It's recognizing that it's not lowering our value, our self-worth, or saying we're terrible people. That's not true. Well, maybe it is true, but we all can be hypocrites, right? There isn't a single person on the face of this earth that's not a hypocrite. But... We've had a lot of people talking about the sovereignty of God, and that's really what it is. Who is king? Am I the king? And you want to talk about really struggling, David was a king. I don't think there's any greater struggle than someone who's given power and authority, not taking it too far. The Message Bible emphasizes the same passage a little bit differently. I don't have it on the screen, but it's God has had it with the proud, but takes delight in just plain people. So be content with who you are and don't put on airs. God's strong hand is on you. He'll promote you at the right time. Pride often leads us to seek our own way because we have convinced ourselves, we have written a story in our head that we know the right thing. And anybody who tries to tell us any different, But God calls us to trust in his timing and his way because the battle with pride is ongoing. We never stop fighting that battle. You don't grow out of it. But the victory comes through humility and reliance on God. The battle with pride is very specific because it's a battle for your heart. What comes from your mouth, out of your mouth comes from the heart. It's not about being defeated or belittled. It's about recognizing our place before God and others. David's humble heart, Jesus' teachings on servanthood, and Peter's exhortation. When you hear exhortation, it just means urging and encouraging. Urgent urging and encouraging. But Peter's urgent encouraging all point to a life that glorifies God and not ourselves. Which leads me in daily life to say, well, ooh, I want to say something Oh, I want to do something. How is God going to be glorified in this? Or am I going to be glorified in this? Jesus taught that pride can severely hinder our ability to be good servants because it focuses all of our attention on ourselves, how people see us, how people think about us, how we think about ourselves, much more than God and what God wants us to focus on. Next week, we're going to be talking about Learning to ask God what it is we should be wanting to ask God for. It's an interesting question. In Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, Jesus describes himself as humble. 
And he wants us to follow and learn from him. It's take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus, who is God incarnate, exemplified humility throughout his ministry. He taught that to be a true servant of God, we have to learn from his example in order to cultivate humility in our lives, to be a good example for others who are learning from our um, example. But that pride obstructs. Pride obstructs the process by making us resistant to correction, resistant to any instruction, resistant to introduction of a, a counterpoint, another fact, another idea, another way of seeing it, making us unteachable, rendering us unreachable, and making us a lot like King David in that passage. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the hard lessons, the examples of David, Absalom, and Peter. We thank you for the grace you give and the wisdom we need to win the battle with pride, relying not on our limited strength, but on your unconditional love. May we, like David, face every giant with humble confidence that comes from the Lord, and may we serve others as Jesus taught, knowing that you will lift us up in due time. For this we will give you the glory. And we ask for in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. If you would please rise and body your spirit as you feel able, we're going to turn to 357 to sing our closing hymn, Just As I Am Without One Plea. Jesus Christ go forth into this world where hunger and thirst persist.
Bring the healing, life-sustaining, nourishing Word of God and the peace and love of Jesus Christ, offering the transforming witness of the Holy Spirit to all you meet. Go in peace and may God's peace go with you always. Amen. Thank you.